As I'm talking to you here, we're in the middle of an unprecedented global trauma. The entire world is wrestling with the coronavirus pandemic. To be sure, there have been much more painful times. I mean, two world wars last century, for example. But nothing like this has ever happened when almost every home on the planet has been impacted all at once. And I think that this unprecedented global shaking is leading to an unprecedented reset of the church. Why do I say this? Because as biblical Christians, we believe that God is doing all things together for the ultimate purpose of exalting Jesus in the earth, which is what the earth needs most. But he exalts Jesus through the church. If God has shaken the entire earth in this unprecedented way, it must mean he wants to reset the church in an unprecedented way. Not too long ago, I got a new iPhone, but it kept giving me problems. So I asked a technician what I'd have to do. And he said, reset it to factory settings. And of course, I knew resetting was much more drastic than simply restarting. Because in a reset, it wipes all the data from the phone. To factory reset an iPhone, you go to settings, then click general, then click reset, then click erase all content and settings. Now, God isn't erasing all content and setting from his church, but there's a whole lot that needs to be re-examined. Reset. I think God is shaking the earth to shake his church. At least that's one big reason. He is executing an unprecedented reset because he wants to reestablish strong foundations in us. Recently, my wife Nancy and I have had to demolish our front porch and have a new one built. The old porch had pulled away from the house and was crumbling. Well, interesting that when the builders dug down to the base of the old porch, they discovered that there were actual cracks in the very foundation of the house itself. In fact, the house was slightly tilting forward. So the crew had to dig much deeper so that they could repair the cracks in the foundation. Now, normally I don't look for the spiritual significance in these kinds of day-to-day -day life experiences, but this time I distinctly felt that the Holy Spirit was using this as a heads up that there are cracks in the church's very foundation, which in this time of unprecedented resetting, we need to address and let the Holy Spirit fix. I believe that it's critical for us in this moment in time to make sure that the foundations of the church are right, the foundations of our understanding of the gospel are right, and the very foundation of how we live is right. I recently read a post from a former Jesus follower who had decided that Christianity wasn't for him. And what, he, what intrigued me was the reason. He said that while he felt there was much truth in the Christian faith, quote, it didn't make me happy, he said. The truth is, most believers I talk to secretly feel the same way. They are not rejecting Jesus, but they really don't know why they don't live in joy and peace most of the time. They struggle to feel spiritual. They feel Christianity isn't working. And more and more people feel like the church is broken. Some have looked to revival as the answer and so passionately pursue God but then find that they've, they've lost the wonder of God passionately pursuing them. And their hunger to encounter God becomes a pressure to encounter God and, and they find themselves driven to keep repeating past experiences of glory until they spiritually burn out. Well, this is a time God wants to reset everything, not deconstruct everything, reset everything. And the way we understand God, the way we experience his presence, the way church functions, the way we develop community, the way we define discipleship, again, unprecedented shaking means an unprecedented reset. Why does God want to reset us? Well, I think there's one huge reason. We have lost what it means to live in and live from intimacy. I suggest intimacy is our single greatest need, and that intimacy is something we are very short of. I know we hear that word and, and, we, and we usually associate it with sex, physical intimacy, but intimacy, to know others deeply and be known deeply by them is what we crave. In fact, I'm going to endeavor to make the case that intimacy rightly understood comes before relationships, comes even before love, that intimacy is the very foundation of genuine community and that intimacy even precedes emotional healing. Now those are big claims, nevertheless, we're going to see just how foundational intimacy is and why we should see these dynamics flowing out of intimacy rather than attempts to grow into intimacy. This study is focused on our biggest need, intimacy with God and with one another. But, and this is the key, not just what it means to walk in intimacy with God, but how to daily live out of that intimacy. And I've come to the conclusion that most of us haven't fully understood what intimacy really is. We think it's an emotion, we think it's love on steroids, or, or perhaps we do get the idea of experiencing intimacy with God through worship and prayer, and that's good for sure. 
But what if I told you that intimacy wasn't a feeling but a worldview? What if I told you that intimacy was not emotional satisfaction but a way of doing life? What if I told you that int intimacy wasn't a relationship but a location? You'd say, what? <laughs> What's up with that? Well, I think God wants to radically change our minds about what intimacy is. If intimacy is our greatest need, and then if our definition of it is wrong, then we'll never get our greatest need met. It's like we have this big need and no way to meet it. So I think God wants to change our minds about what intimacy is. One good definition of intimacy would go something like this. A relationship in which two people are secure enough to be vulnerable with each other and safe enough to be honest. Of course, if we think intimacy as being secure enough to be vulnerable and safe enough to be honest, I bet you we, we can probably count on one hand whom we feel we might have this kind of intimacy with. But how do we actually get to this place of vulnerability and safety? How do we get to this place of security and honesty? That, that's what we want to discover. And one of the things we'll realize in our study is that there are only two pathways in life. All people everywhere are going down one of these two pathways. I'll identify one of them in a minute. But the path we're talking about here is the path of intimacy. And the path of intimacy is the only one that leads to joy and peace. As I've said, intimacy is way more than an experience. It's a way of living life. We're used to thinking about how to live in intimacy with God. Worship, prayer, obedience, commitment to be his disciples, humility. What I am advocating for is not so much living in intimacy with God, which, by the way, I hunger for and have valued for decades. But what I'm advocating for here is living from intimacy in God. I would argue that intimacy is not first what we develop with God, but a new place and nature we live out of in God. What I'm focusing on here is intimacy grounded completely in the cross of Jesus Christ. In fact, I want to make a bold assertion here. The unparalleled key to a life of intimacy is the cross. And understanding this comes before intimacy with God. Otherwise, our worship, prayer, and obedience become performance behaviors, things we do to achieve intimacy with God. Intimacy is more than a relationship. It's a location. It's a position. It's the starting point for actual victorious living. It's an environment of immediate security and safety. It is a spiritual ecosystem and worldview. All aspects which we will unpack in the course of our study. This intimacy is found only in the cross. And because this intimacy is based in the cross, it defines a core message of the gospel. A largely forgotten message of the gospel. This forgotten gospel is the good news that the cross offers us a completely new and different way of being human. That is the polar opposite of being human in the world system. This way is defined as crucified with Christ in Galatians 2.20. Being crucified is much more joyous than most of us have understood. We think to be crucified with Christ is to keep trying to kill off the old selfish nature. And that is not what Paul is saying here. As we'll see, he is describing the freedom from our old nature, our self, and the release into a new nature in which we continuously experience the resurrection life of Jesus. I would call this crucifixion intimacy. Again, we'll come back to. And this is an intimacy that is given, not developed. We have been given this intimacy and now are free to live out of this intimacy. It's a manner of life that is the polar opposite to the world's manner of living. We often don't realize how revolutionary Christ's first public message was. Repent, for the kingdom is now at hand. And one way you could put this is, the kingdom is within your grasp. In that one statement, Jesus is offering complete freedom from one domain and the power to enter another domain. Freedom from the world's culture and system and freedom to enter the kingdom culture and system. These are the only two societies in which to live, and each has its own way of life. The kingdom way is the way of intimacy, and the world way is the way of independence. Now, I know this raises some questions like, well, I thought it was a good thing to be independent. We will contrast these two ways of life in another session, how completely opposite they are, and, and the confusion and even depression that happens when we try to live in them both. But for now, let's just keep going in our understanding of intimacy and what I'm calling this forgotten gospel. I'm convinced that it is the rediscovery of this forgotten gospel of crucified intimacy, which is one of the core reasons for why God is resetting the church. We need to be reset to our factory settings. And those factory settings are found at the cross. And this is the basis for everything else in life. 
This forgotten gospel is why so many believers have left the faith, why so many privately struggle. It is why so many secretly wonder if the church really works anymore. I want to make another somewhat startling claim. Worship, prayer, and obedience flow out of this intimacy. For most of my life, I've seen these disciplines as the way I develop intimacy, and I realize that over time, what this did was dull my motivation to do these things because it was me doing them in order to develop intimacy with God. But crucifixion intimacy reverses this. My intimacy with God is not based on my worship, it is not based on my prayer, it is not based on my obedience, but rather being crucified with Christ. Now, before I continue to connect the dots between the cross, the forgotten gospel, and intimacy, let me make this journey personal and share with you why this message about intimacy has impacted me so deeply and why I think this is a massive part of the reset of the church. I come from a long tradition of what I would call self-effort spirituality. I've loved Jesus and I've wanted to obey him. I've wanted to be his disciple. But for the most part, my life has been marked by trying really hard to be a Christian. It's not that I've never understood grace. I I, I was transformed by the message of grace early on in my walk with the Lord. And I've grown significantly in my understanding of grace. And because I grew in grace, I grew increasingly free from feeling condemned. I mean, the Holy Spirit's conviction was constructive and healthy to me. I learned to love the lifestyle of repentance because I saw repentance as the first word of the good news that Jesus came to preach. I increasingly grew free from shame because I learned that we don't obey to get God's favor. We obey because we've already got God's favor. I felt secure as far as it went. Though I was freer from shame and guilt, there were other areas in my life that I did not feel so free. I wasn't so free from anger and anxiety, for instance. And I would do all the things we do to overcome these attitudes. Confess scripture, double down on my disciplines, try hard to pray and break through. Even when it came to walking in the Spirit, I would worship with abandon, but then feel uneasy if I didn't feel God's presence the same way I felt him the last time I worshiped. I would pray day after day, keep it up for a while, get out of the rhythm of prayer, and then feel guilty for not praying. I figured if if I just prayed harder, worshiped longer, did my utmost to obey, I would finally experience joy and peace as the norm and not the exception. I, I knew that I didn't want to live like those who found their peace in an over, overly mystical place. People who use spirituality to escape from the hard stuff of life. And I also knew that I didn't want to be like others who settle into a passivity in the name of divine sovereignty that detaches them from life. Mysticism and passivity weren't going to really deal with the roots of anger and anxiety. And, and I never wanted to slip into a sloppy agape either. You know, I love God too much to take his grace for granted and just get by and ignore root attitudes in me that were so destructive. But deep inside of me, I still felt that the blessing of God was on my obedience. I knew that I was justified, saved by grace and grace alone. I grew in my understanding that God's grace empowers us, but I still found myself striving, found myself driven, and I gleaned good stuff from all the Henry Cloud books and dozens of others that I've read that have nourished my soul and have given me a fresh taste of freedom. Still, I found myself bouncing between God's grace and my effort. I still found myself trying to forgive when I was offended and love where it was hard. 1 Corinthians 13 seemed to be a very high bar that I could never quite attain. I still found myself comparing myself with others too often, still struggled too often with failure. And it wasn't that I had a a poor self-image or didn't value myself. I was healthy on both counts. But more and more, I began to to detect a bent to performance that underlay the way I saw everything. And why was this? God knows I've tried to be a good disciple, tried to keep denying myself and take up my cross, turn the other cheek and forgive seven times, 70 times, smile sweetly when someone gut punches me with rejection. God knows I've gone for heart healing too, healing of emotions and healing of memories and healing from wounds and deliverance from destructive thinking patterns, what what some would call strongholds. Done all this stuff. Still, something was missing. Joy and peace were still the exception and not the norm of life. A couple of years ago, two big thoughts exploded in my mind. The first had to do with just how the power of sin was broken in my life. Paul says in Romans 6 verse 7, when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. Now, how exactly is the power of sin broken? More on this in a later session, but let me just give you a snapshot here. The root problem of everything that is wrong is independence. 
Why do I say that? Well, if you look at the account of Lucifer, Satan's fall in Isaiah 14, verse 12 to 15, you'll find that when Lucifer rebelled against God, he didn't try to usurp God's authority. That's not what he was doing. That would have been stupid. All Satan wanted was to act independently of God's authority. This bent to act independently of God is the first recorded instance that we have of something going wrong in God's perfect creation. This root of independence is what every human being exhibits. Independence, some would say pride, is the root issue of the human condition. Now, when someone surrenders to Jesus, admits their 100% helplessness and Christ's 100% sufficiency, that very admission lays an ax to the root of independence, and that's what breaks the power of sin. Now, we as God's children are free from the domination of sin. Come back to that in just a minute. But the second big thought that hit me had to do with what we are now as new creatures, what exactly that means. And Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5.17 that we are new creations, not just spirit-filled humans, not just improved versions of ourselves, but in some way new selves. But exactly how are we new? Galatians 2.20 became the hinge on which this understanding of intimacy turned for me. I am crucified with Christ, Paul says. Nevertheless, I live. What a paradox. For years, I thought that being crucified with Christ was about learning to die to self. I, I knew that I was crucified with Christ from his point of view, crucified with Christ as a standing or a position in Christ, in him. But from my point of view, to be crucified was either about a life struggle between my flesh and my spirit or a legal standing that I took by faith, but that didn't really translate into daily victory, joy, and peace. Then it hit me. I was completely crucified and raised once. At the moment I surrendered to Christ, one and done, I'm already crucified and raised. It's my new starting point in life, living, living out of this crucifixion resurrection every day, often several times a day. Now you might say, well, this just sounds like cheap grace to me, ah, but it's not. And I think this study will bear that out. See, what the Lord did was make it possible for me to participate in my salvation every day through crucifixion and resurrection. As I said, when I surrendered to Jesus, I admitted 100% helplessness and Christ's 100% sufficiency. And at that moment, I was crucified and raised with Christ. The rest of my life, and this is key, the rest of my life is about living from that center. I just keep repeating the pattern every day. Every time I confront a negative, every time I feel anxiety or anger, every time I am rejected, just repeat the pattern. Lord, I am weak and helpless at this moment. Yet even as I admit my helplessness, that's the moment I'm depending on you. So I yield to you. There's total security and safety in surrender. And this is where intimacy is found. When we're weak, then we're strong. That was the big secret Paul found. And he gives us a glimpse of that in 2 Corinthians 12. You don't try to depend on the Lord. Your admission of weakness is the dependence. Your ability to depend is not dependent on you. You just have to embrace weakness and yield to the Spirit. And the paradox is that you first yield by admitting you can't even depend on God on your own. Now, some call this cruciformity, kind of like the word conformity, only being conformed to the cross. Yeah, but that just like, sounds like trying really hard to die to myself. No, not at all. Actually, it's living already dead to self, crucified, one and done. So let me summarize here before we close this out. To fully understand this new life, this crucifixion intimacy, which is, I've said is the forgotten gospel, we need to understand the following. Number one, you are born into independence. Number two, to be truly converted, born again, only happens when we admit 100% helplessness and acknowledge Christ's 100% sufficiency. There's no 90% let me figure out whether or not I will make Jesus my Lord. It has to be 100%. And this is what breaks the power of sin because at the moment you admit you are helpless and Christ is sufficient, that's what lays the ax to the root of independence. Number three, at this moment of total surrender, the Holy Spirit enters into you and makes you a new creation, not just a spirit-filled human, but a new human entirely. And number four, this immediately places us in Christ, which is not only a position we have, but an intimacy we live from. It's our new location. This new way of being human is living from a new inward center of crucified and raised with Christ. We live, number six, from that center by repeating the pattern set at our conversion throughout the rest of our lives, embracing helplessness and weakness, which is simultaneously our act of dependence on the Holy Spirit, which automatically cultivates joy and peace in us. This, according to Paul, is living from the cross as a new way of living. It is the freedom now of living from our original transformation point, which was total helplessness, total dependence on him.
In this way, we participate in our own ongoing salvation, which is part of what Paul meant when he spoke of being in Christ. And finally, ongoing transformation happens as we participate in a crucified and raised life that is ours through continual helplessness and dependence, which results in peace. And living crucified and raised, participating in your salvation through embracing weakness, is not only the new way of being human, it is the core understanding of what intimacy is. Because many have forgotten this essential part of the gospel, we have actually never discovered the new creation nature we were meant to live by and live in. Because we have forgotten this essential part of the gospel, we've never realized the security that is ours from an intimacy already given to us. Instead, practical Christianity is, for most people, a struggle to be like Jesus, an effort to obey, often feeling defeated because we can't overcome paralyzing emotions like anxiety or offense. And because we've forgotten this part of the gospel, church is something we build rather than something we flow out of. Because we've forgotten this part of the gospel, church has become a higher version of human community rather than an entirely new community whose common life is Christ. Most churches Common life is around their sense of connection and whether or not their personal destiny is fulfilled in church. And this is so far from what Jesus had in mind. But this forgotten gospel, this crucifixion intimacy will release you into the joy and peace, the victorious life that you've always hoped you would find as a follower of Jesus.